use this technique, uh, and once again we see with his two titles. Well, they actually now turns out not the most outside, but they're among the most, the most outlier titles. So then we said, okay, what is the problem? Like, what's going on here, right? And we actually looked at his pages, and I sorry, I don't have it on my laptop. And what we noticed is that the reason he's such an outlier is turns out he's actually very systematically changed where is his title. So here he is. From book to from book to book. So every chapter has a different style. So I said, can we can visualize it? Yeah. So it looks like this. So uh, every graph shows the progression of uh, his title over time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight corresponds to books, right? So the title, sorry, the chapters, the chapter, the, chapter, the, chapter, the, the, eight, the title has eight chapters. When every graph plots how a particular feature changes over time. And what you see is that it's actually very really interesting details, right? Where in some cases, okay, it's not very, really, not very interesting here. But for example, here it's like this wave pattern, right? Uh, and in fact, the energy is also measured of temperature, so it has more temperature. With more texture, less texture, more texture, less texture, right? So for example, this is standard deviation, which is the really measure of a given gray tones in the image, and again, you can see that it kind of changes quite a lot. So, okay. Uh, and then I basically, I can, it's still work in progress, I basically combine it all. I combine this all. So it looks like this. And, uh, and then I look at his, uh, in another title, and, uh, Okay, then I simply this is like I think where it ends. Okay. Uh, so here, here are the two titles, and uh, each graph shows you how a particular visual feature changes over time. Okay, and it's beautiful. Uh, I think we actually have to look at what these features are to make meaning of it. Uh, but the idea is that when we think about, for example, the yesterday I showed you your time, we will look at the patterns in movement. But of course, what you want to do, you look at the patterns simultaneously, movement, color, composition, semantics, everything, right? This is the first attempt. Sorry, guys, I know it's not very visual, but, uh, and then we also did this, right? So compare these titles using color coordinates. And I think that's what you right? For Campbell's um, they commissioned them to re-evaluate the, the way that the perception of the label is, is seen on the shelf. Oh, yeah. And so, the, I mean, it's a little bit more like that, but for instance, remove all the spoon. Maybe, maybe, oh, maybe we can just make it bigger. Yeah. So this is the idea of. So can people yeah. want to read this, right? Yeah. The context is, you know, can on a shelf in a supermarket. So that's the context of the kind of attention, the real estate of attention span we're talking about. When you go to the label, you know, shifting of, for example, that the soup was um, redundant. Uh, the spoon is yes, redundant. Yes, exactly. And the, the smoke, the steam is very emotive and you know, kind of uh, attractive, so we have to incorporate the steam and the bowls of the Right, the shifting of the, the, the candles, we thought that in, in the, uh, on the top and the bottom was more appropriate, less, uh, less intrusive. Um, so these are kind of shifts of things in me. For me, it's an interesting exercise because Campbell's soup is already so, so loaded into the icon mm -hmm. that I, I'm, I'm a little surprised that it actually got more kind of. But it's still, it's still a little bit. Yeah. And so, um, for me, it seems a little bit more, more elaborate and decorative than yeah. honestly, but I think that it's a combination of, you know, kind of the, the space of your attention. And, and also, it's interesting because it's in the context of these cans being on the shop in a supermarket as well, so I'm just going to tell this camera Yeah, what's interesting is, you know, uh, actually, a big part of my PhD dissertation was kind of talking about how, in fact, you know, there this avant-garde artists, I mean, Russians, Germans, and I think they really wanted to engineer visual communication. We didn't have the devices, but one of the ideas behind creating new visual language, which would consist from simple geometric elements with colors, is very actually very much influenced by the contemporary research in visual perception. Yeah. And they said, okay, now if I'm going to make a painting which is going to have, you know, like three squares of different colors, maybe I can completely control people's emotional response. So, because we were kind of, we didn't have these devices, and also they were limited, right? 
where you saw we were very much influenced by the contemporary perception study, cont sorry, contemporary uh, psychology of perceptions, which was already reductive, right? Yes, we talk about these experiments. Well, typical experiment at the time was, again, you show people some kind of stimuli, which would have, for example, you know, two, two rectangles, and you were going to change their colors until people can no longer differentiate. It was indication that Kandinsky was like studying this, and then became an of his painting, but it also became an attempt to create this very reliable technique of visual communication, because we thought we actually be able to control it. But now, of course, we can actually measure how people look at difficulty of images, so we don't have to use abstraction, right? Yeah. So it's interesting. But do we have any change images of, uh, we have, let me actually show you how these images look when you record eye movements, okay? And the people also now do it for web design. Okay, so it's actually really kind of interesting themselves. So this is a bit small. <coughs> Basically, this is how so this is how it looks. For example, if you show somebody like a webpage, they record eye movements. This is, this is what you get, right? Um. So I assume that I assume it's a color. So I assume this is recording not of one person but of many many people, mm. and I, I assume that the color maybe corresponds to uh, just the, you know, just basically heat map. So it also corresponds to how many people are looking at the area, and maybe maybe this red. Maybe this violet uh, process corresponds to particular fixations, but we have to do article. Yeah, so this is you know, becoming more common. Uh, we can find more examples. Uh, and of course, you can also analyze it over time. So, second uh, side of this. So, this is the HCI. You can actually do it. Also use it, for example, for the group design of interfaces. Yeah. Right. So here you go. Right. And again, sorry, I'm finding some good images here, but you know, it's kind of the same image as uh, Yeah, so this is the example of eye movements, I guess, over particular. I'm curious if anybody knows if there's a relationship between um, eye track and eye trace used in cinematography. What's eye trace? Eye trace is this, I think it's a fascinating technology because it, it uses the same kind of technology of scientifically mechanically looking at um, viewers' eye movements, but in more of a um, there's more control on the, the side of the image because <coughs> the moving image can control where mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the viewers look yes, yes, to yes. the point where the viewer doesn't notice that their their eyes are actually moving and following the image. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes, like yes, the yes, frame yes. will move, and like if if the viewer is uh, made to look into the eyes of the person who's being mm -hmm. photographed, and the frame will wander, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the viewers will always be looking at that same part of the image. I see, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very really interesting idea. Mm -hmm. So, so and you know about I mean, there are particular kind of films which, which use this technique? Only one specifically do I know that there's yeah, an example. Because it sounds very, very something very, very not, not very common. It's not very I mean, common, normally but it's to the point person, where yeah. you don't really notice it. It's very subliminal. But I think maybe what, let's say we follow a person, right? The person goes along the street and the camera follows the person. So I guess you're going to follow a person, right? So maybe in this, maybe in this version is actually used, but it's actually, it's not used maybe consciously by filmmakers, but it's like how they act, right? Well, it's, um, it's a specific, I, I trace it a specific <laughs> cinema, cinematographic mm -hmm. technique. Um, if anybody saw the remake of the Manchurian Candidate, mm -hmm. it was used very appropriately in there. So, like the users were actually being programmed mm -hmm. while um, watching the movie. And I, I just want to offer that that like in painting, like the the history of directing attention with three point perspective uh, and, and compositing uh, pictorial surfaces is ancient. It's like hundreds of years old, 
and the way that it's being uh, dynamized or whatever in, into these kind of formal systems, especially like in the advertising world or cinematic world, is like a, just a building on, on that basic understanding of sure, well, human eye focus. Yeah. And so, um, I think this is, you guys, <coughs> it sounds like you guys like this topic, so maybe just show you one more thing. I mean, you can explore it on your own. Let me just show you one more thing. What happens if you record nine moments of the time? So what we do is now every time we design a new interface, let's say we design an apple, a number, we're going to do it just to see like what like where you know where people are looking. And what I and actually you know, I was at some conference where I saw lots of studies. And it turns out that you know, because also now we're recording brain waves, right? I mean, right? MRI, but MRI has a very low resolution. So it's kind of hard to see what's going on. So it's actually about eye movement. Like, like I'm going to show this video, I'm not sure exactly what this video is, but basically looking at somebody's video of like somebody, for example, interacting with the phone, and you can see a very direct relationship between what the person wants to do and where the person is looking. Mm -hmm. So it seems like eye movements are actually very interesting because you can really understand them very easily, whereas understanding, for example, brain activity is just much harder and also much more expensive. Mm -hmm. If you want to with certain with systems, you know, just to put 256 you know, uh, sensors on your head, that's like $300,000. Mm -hmm. right? And this is like $5,000. Okay, I know it's going to play well, but it doesn't have to play. Well. Thank you for the video game research, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, if you try, okay, this one doesn't work. Well, it was leading. Okay. And specialist eye tracking services allow you to find inside your users' heads and see your designs through their eyes. Oh, <laughs> Are they noticing the critical elements? Is the design efficient? Are users concentrating on the content or are they distracted? We can tell you this and more. So what does an eye tracking session look like? Here's a user interacting with a website. The blue dots show his eye fixation yeah, while connecting. There's no way to close this window, right? There is, there is also, yeah. Uh -huh. Because it's like, you know, you're kind of suffering here, right? <laughs> Now they have uh, little ads that move according to whether you're a male or a female looking at it. You know, they can tell your interest and then it switches. I don't know, I subscribe to Springwise and they always have the newest ideas all over the world. It's, yeah, in some city, I don't know which one, I have to look it up again, but... Yeah, the, the ad is looking at you and, and, and tracks your interest and if you're not interested, it'll switch. Something else. Yeah. Oh my God. So it's really not like interactive. Vivek is using that technology yes. and, and, and developing the ad plans for YouTube and a bunch of other social media sites. Well, I guess I, mean, I guess if you know the gender of a person who is at the stage, like, you know, right? That's why they ask. Right now we're like, right like, now we're you can visit custom. Exactly. So what should we like? Yeah. This information shows us where he looks, what he pays the most attention to, and most importantly, what he misses. <laughs> Watching a user in real time is interesting, but the speed of movement makes it hard to keep track of what users see and what they miss. That's why we produce an individual session map at the end of each. Yeah, so it's basically it's, it's kind of, kind of, kind of a little bit related to the new right? Yeah. So what you do is you simply pay this movie and you overlay all the frames, right? And you get this again kind of heat map session to show the sum total of all their visual activity. Each numbered circle represents a point that the user's eyes fixated on. The larger the circle, the longer the fixation. A series of erratic eye movements suggests that the user was confused by a disorganized layout, mm -hmm. while a series of controlled eye movements show that the user was reading. The density of these movements helps us to establish their level of concentration and comprehension. Once all users have been through the process, we turn the results into heat maps. Heat maps are perhaps the most revealing of all the outputs from an eye tracking study. While session maps tell you a lot about the behavior of an individual user, a heat map shows you the behavior of an entire group of people. Heat maps use a graded color scheme to show visual activity. Warmer colors reveal areas that most users looked at, while colder colors show areas that few users noticed. Black reveals areas that no one looked at. In this particular example, you can see that no one noticed the 499 DVD sale, despite its size and vibrant colors. This type of information is invaluable whether you're pulling together a new design or simply evaluating an existing one. 
Unlike conventional eye tracking solutions, our system doesn't require users to wear any complicated devices like helmets or specialist eyewear. In fact, the whole system is virtually invisible, keeping users at ease throughout the process. To learn more about eye tracking and our other user experience services, visit us on the web www.entra.com. Okay, so, Do you know what you're using? <laughs> okay, so I know what's, uh, actually, it's what's going to break up. Here's what I can we do one thing because I, I just I have like one last thing to show you, which That's I think fun. is very very impressive because it's done not by me, done by professionals. It's actually it's actually from uh, from Microsoft. Uh, so you know we bought this company. We bought it. It was actually been developed at university and we bought this company, and it kind of shows you in state of art in. Uh, not just visualization, but it's actually very much this idea of direct visualization, where what you're doing is just taking layouts out of images to notice patterns. So it's six minutes, and after that, let's take a break, and then we can sort of continue. So this is actually, so I know that uh, you, t you told me that uh, Henry showed you like six, ten videos. I'm only going to show you one, and it's only six minutes. Mm, right? As long as they're relevant. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just do a whole class, like watch ten videos and discuss them. Should do it sometime. Okay, so let me see if we can find out. It's called Kivit. Now it's again, it's a software you can download it. It runs on Windows, like in a game Macintosh, you can put the emulator, right? So it's all usable. Oh, 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 the discussion, we don't want blocks, okay, with videos. Uh, hold on, guys, let's see, okay, so that's not what I wanted. No, I don't mind, okay. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, how do we how do we find videos? Well, it's the picking you. Oh, yeah. Do a search, they're all filed under the same. Right here? Uh, oh, do just search, the, yeah, where you are. Yeah, who you're yeah, looking for. Is, I got, I got, I got, I got, I think it's discussions, right? Oh, oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, it's not what I want. Okay, so I'm just sorry. Just find the person you're looking for. Yeah, I'll say what it is. But I think this is it, right? Yeah, this is it. Yeah, yeah it says video. <coughs> well, I have to say, you know, I'm a little embarrassed because you realize like, that I'm just, you know, we're just being amateurs. But uh, but at the same time, it doesn't, you know, it does a particular thing very well, it doesn't do everything, right? And the key difference is that, you know, we're basically taking like your kind of table, right? Like, a, you know, like Excel, and then just giving you a way to very quickly change uh, parameters on what the X and Y is. And also, and also connecting it to the data. So it's, I would say it's also maybe very much your space, probably what, you know, what I think Latour kind of means conceptually when he thinks about interactive visualization. Can this make it bigger? Or is it here? Oh, we need to make the sound. Yeah. Yeah. You guys hear the sound or should we connect the sound? No, it's 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 maybe it's better for the video yeah, to yeah. connect the sound. It might be better for oh. oh, sorry, sorry. You have to be captured, right? But when you do it, it's easy. Yeah. Okay, If I can leave you with one big idea today, it's that the whole of the data in which we consume is greater than the sum of the parts. And instead of thinking about information overload, what I'd like you to think about is how we can use information so that patterns pop and we can see trends that would otherwise be invisible. So what we're looking at right here is a typical mortality chart organized by age. This tool that I'm using here is a little experiment, it's called Pivot, and with Pivot what I can do is I can choose to filter on one particular cause of death, say accidents. And right away, I see there's a different pattern that emerges. This is because in the mid area here, people are their most active, and over here, they're their most frail. We can step back out again, and then reorganize the data by cause of death, seeing that circulatory diseases and cancers are the usual suspects, but not for everyone. If we go ahead and we filter by age, say 40 years or less, we see that accidents are actually the greatest cause that people have to be worried about. Yeah, so can I just say, so you know, uh, I think like after watching the second time, you didn't understand what's going on. So what we've done is we've done like 200 year old visualization technique, which is a bar chart. Mm -hmm. and normally a bar chart is used to represent just, just one color of data. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're using bar chart to represent two colors, right? 
You could somehow you know how to like, read this techniques. Right? Mm -hmm. And you draw into that, it's especially the case for men. So you get the idea that viewing information, viewing data in this way, is a lot like swimming and then living information infographic. And if we can do this for raw data, why not do it for content as well? So what we have right here is the cover of every single Sports Illustrated ever produced. It's all here, it's all on the web. You can go back to your rooms and try this after my talk. With Pivot, you can drill into a decade. You can drill into a particular year. You can jump right into a specific issue. So I'm looking at this, I see the athletes that have appeared in this issue, the sports. I'm a Lance Armstrong fan. So I'll go ahead and I'll click on that, which reveals for me all the issues in which Lance Armstrong's been a part of. <laughs> now, if I want to just kind of take a peek at these, I might think, well, what about taking a look at all cycling? So I can step back and expand on that. And I see Greg LeMond now. And so you get the idea that when you navigate over information this way, going narrow, broader, backing in, backing out, you're not searching, you're not browsing, you're doing something that's actually a little bit different, it's in between, and we think it changes the way information can be used. So I want to extrapolate on this idea a bit with something that's a little bit crazy. What we've done here is we've taken every single Wikipedia page and we reduced it down to a little summary. So the summary consists of just a little synopsis and an icon to indicate the topical area that it comes from. I'm only showing the top 500 most popular Wikipedia pages right here. But even in this limited view, we can do a lot of things. Right away, we get a sense of what are the topical domains that are most popular on Wikipedia. I'm going to go ahead and select government. Now, having selected government, I can now see that the Wikipedia categories that most frequently correspond to that are Time Magazine People of the Year. So this is really important because this is an insight that was not contained within any one Wikipedia page. It's only possible to see that insight when you step back and look at all of them. Looking at one of these particular summaries, I can then drill into the concept of Time Magazine Person of the Year, bringing up all of them. So looking at these people, I can see that the majority come from government, some have come from natural sciences, some, fewer still, have come from business, there's my boss, <laughs> and uh, one has come from music. And interestingly <laughs> enough, Bono is also a Tech Prize winner. So we can go jump and take a look at all the Tech Prize winners. So you see, we're navigating the web for the first time as if it's actually a web. Not from page to page, but at a higher level of abstraction. And so I want to show you one other thing that may catch you a little bit by surprise. I'm just showing the New York Times website here. So pivot this application. I don't want to call it a browser. It's really not a browser. But you can view web pages with it. And we bring that zoomable technology to every single web page like this. So I can step back, pop right back into a specific section. Now the reason why this is important is because by virtue of just viewing web pages in this way, I can look at in my entire browsing history in the exact same way. So I can drill into what I've done over specific time frames. Here, in fact, is the state of all the demo that I just gave. And I can sort of replay some stuff that I was looking at earlier today. And if I want to step back and look at everything, I can slice and dice my history, perhaps by my search history. Here I was doing some nepotistic searching, looking for Bing over here for Live Labs Pivot. And from these, I can drill into the web page and just launch them again. It's one metaphor repurposed multiple times, and in each case, it makes the whole greater than the sum of the parts with the data. So right now, in this world, we think about data as being this curse. We talk about the curse of information overload. We talk about drowning in data. What if we can actually turn that upside down and turn the web upside down? So that instead of navigating from one thing to the next, we get used to the habit of being able to go from many things to many things, and then being able to see the patterns that were otherwise hidden. If we can do that, then instead of being trapped in data, we might actually extract information. And instead of dealing just with information, we can tease out knowledge, and if we get the knowledge, then maybe there's wisdom to be found. So with that, I thank you. Yeah, so I think this is a uh, I think this is a
a totally perfect uh, conclusion to the infamous part of my class, and we still have you know, a number of hours to go, things, because we started by looking at some various graphs from the late 18th century, and, you know, and some of the early graphs of bar charts. And now, 200, 200 years later, we had computer graphics, we had interactivity, and what we get is something, right, a kind of bar chart 2.0, and I think this is also a very perfect illustration of what we discussed today about this idea of, I mean, I don't think it's a very good term, but let's say what I call direct visualization, meaning visualization which actually consists from the actual artifacts, right? Okay, break. <laughs>